My first guest uh, makes his acting debut in Rocky III, and if you've seen the film, you know that he isn't an easy guy to forget. If you haven't, you'll soon see why. Please welcome Mr. T. You make, a, you make an impressive entrance. Before we get started, uh, you were so frightening in that motion picture. Uh, and uh, Have you acted before, or was that just you we were watching there? Well, the character calls uh, to be hungry, and I've been hungry all my life, so it wasn't a problem. That's why I wore these combat boots, because it's symbolic of my struggle. I'm born in the ghetto and raised on welfare, so that's what sort of the character was about. Yeah. A lot of people mistake him for being mean and and hateful. He don't hate, he's just hungry. He's been pushed aside so long. Here he's the number one challenger and still he don't get a shot at the title. So that makes the guy mad. Yeah. So that's where I've been. I've been lost a lot of jobs and things like that. What so kind of jobs were you, were you uh, like secretarial work I'm guessing is out. That's, <laughs> that's uh, you don't, I, I just, I'm just a joke. I just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Now you See, have that's why I'm squeezing this ball, you know, because so I won't get too mad. I was mad last week I was supposed to come on, and, and I'm, a very, I'm, I'm a very impatient guy. You know, a lot of things I could be doing, so I come here, I said, so in case he get to telling them corny jokes, I'm going to squeeze this ball. If I squeeze the ball too many times, if, I, if you see me squeeze the ball over ten times, that means cut jokes. I don't square it about six times already. Oh, shit. Six. We're up to, we're up to six, so we have six over here. Now, you're just, uh, uh, let's explain what happened last week. You were scheduled to be on the show, uh, and we ran out of time. I know what it was, it was the elevator races. Right, it really made me mad. <laughs> really, were you actually angry about that? Oh, I was very mad. Some man, I believe in, see like the tattoo on my arm, TCB, I believe in taking care of business. I came here to do the show. Mr. T do not like to wait for nothing. Yeah. And nobody. Uh-huh. Uh, well, I'd, let me just apologize for any okay. inconvenience, and we're, we're glad to have, you didn't squeeze okay. it again, did you? It's okay. Uh, eight times, you got two more times. <laughs> eight times. It's okay. <laughs> It's okay because he's paying me for it, so it's all right. So, That's right, yeah. You know. And once I'm getting paid for it, see, I need the money to help buy my mother a house and to help uh, build a community center for the kids in Chicago, mm -hmm. for less fortunate people in Chicago. That's what I'm about. So all the money I get on these shows, and I save the money and give to the people who really need it. A lot of people yeah. are out of work and don't have jobs, yeah. so they can use the money. And I want to talk about your, uh, your name, first of all. Is that your real name? Well, if Pope John Paul II was to come here, would you ask him what his real name was? Well, uh, <laughs> but it, you have to, it, it's an interesting name, Mr. T. Right, well, I changed it because I wasn't given respect before. You know, people have a tendency to always constantly call a man boy. For what reason, I don't know why, you know. So I changed mm -hmm. my name to Mr. T, so the first word out of everybody's mouth would be Mr. The sign of respect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, do you, do you have a first name? Or first name is Mr. My middle name is that period. My last name is the T. <laughs> You mentioned before that this was your first acting part, and you don't really consider yourself to be an actor now, do you? Right, I'm glad you brought that up. You know, a lot of people, they sort of get offended because I don't sign autographs. And let me explain to everybody. I consider myself a bodyguard. I'm a full-time bodyguard and a part-time actor. Bodyguard, and I feel my self-worth. I like protecting people. I know mm -hmm. I can make more money in the movies, but there's something special about bodyguard, and therefore, that's why I don't sign autographs. I might be somewhere protecting somebody, and somebody running up to me asking me for the autograph, they might get killed. Who, so who I don't is, want them who, involved with that. <laughs> says, it, says the truth. Yeah. Who, truth. Who, are, who are some of the people that you are currently uh, guarding? Well, or your most recent client? You know. <laughs> yes, you do. I do? Yeah. Oh. Um. I mean, the reason why I say that at the you can't, pause you can't because, no, it's understood. Everybody just about in the world know who I've been protecting, but I don't like to keep throwing all them big names around because oh, okay. everybody I protect is important. I protect the welfare, mothers, children, people who couldn't even afford my salary. Yeah. So I get tired of throwing around the big name oh. people I protect. Everybody I protect are special and famous to me because their life is yeah. something special. Now, before you got into bodyguarding, you worked as a, a bouncer in some clubs in Chicago? I'm glad you brought that up. I worked in the, on the door. There's a difference between a bouncer and a doorman. Oh. 
a bouncer is the type of guy he really gets off on physically putting his hand on people. I mm-hmm. don't. Yeah. I consider myself a security specialist at the door. That's different. <laughs> <you know. laughs> Security specialist. Have you have you ever had to rough somebody up though? I mean, you you try and reason with them first, right? No, I'm mean, like I said, I don't try to put a lot of emphasis on roughing people up and things like that. If I get a guy out peacefully, I've done my job. I don't like putting my hands on nobody because I don't like nobody putting their hands on me. Mm-hmm. You know, I just try to use a little tact and diplomacy. That's all. So, say somebody is causing a disturbance and you go over there and you can't talk them into leaving. Then what do you do? Oh, I might buy them another drink because I really try to avoid trouble. Uh-huh. Really, I do. Yeah. You know, I try to make my job easy as possible. Yeah. I'm not into this physical thing or this macho thing. A lot of guys, they're into that. They, they might see me on walking down the street. You don't look so tough to me because they have this thing they got to prove. I don't have nothing to prove to anybody. You know, they can say what they want about my hairstyle, my earrings, all that. As long as they don't touch me, I'm fine. Mm-hmm. You know, they fine, rather. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um... Can, we, can, can I ask you about your, uh, since you mentioned your hairstyle and, and your jewelry and so forth? Right, right, right. I'm glad you brought that up. The hairstyle is, <laughs> the hairstyle is not punk rock. It's not Mohegan Indians because a lot of people relate it to the Mohegan Indians because that's all they know. As a tribe in Africa that calls themselves the Mandinka Warriors, they wear their hair in this fashion. They wear feathered earrings. They wear diamond gold. They wear the finest they ears. And I'm proud to be a descendant of mm-hmm. the people. Mm-hmm. And that's the reason why I wear this hair. And the changes in gold is symbolic of my struggle because... My ancestors, we was brought over here, we were shackled by our wrists and our necks and ankles. Mm-hmm. But now I turn those shackles into gold, and that offends people. People ask me, say, do that gold get heavy? Mm-hmm. Nobody asks my ancestors, do the old changes get heavy mm-hmm. on their neck? Mm-hmm. You know? yeah. But it bothers them because they know the gold is valuable. But that's the reason why I wear the gold and the earrings and diamonds. It's an interesting that. story that a man uh, working as a bodyguard and a security specialist in uh, bars in Chicago uh, gets to be, actually, you pretty well steal the movie. Uh, how do you make that jump from whatever you do there, and talking people out of causing trouble, to being in a major motion picture? Just being hungry, you know what you want to do, and first of all, I'm so thankful to God that I had the opportunity. You know, I am successful because I believe in God, and God is in my life, that's why I'm successful. I'm not bad, I'm not tough, I'm not rough, I'm not nothing, I'm just thankful to God, that's why I'm successful. But uh, it's being hungry, you got to be hungry. Then working with a guy like Sylvester Stallone, He's a perfectionist. But how you did know. you get the job? I mean, there's plenty of hungry folks here, but... Yeah, you know. well, you got to be, you know, when you... It was being talented. See, what are you... See, I knew I could act a long time ago. When I was in first grade, my teacher used to always tell me, why don't you stop acting a fool? Stop acting a clown. <laughs> so if I knew if I could act a fool and act a clown, I can act anything, you, you know what I mean? Sure. And I've been acting all my life. It's just that now people begin to pay me for it. Yeah. And pay they do. <laughs> Definitely. All right. All right. All right. But back to your question, you know, like I said, it was that I had an opportunity, so I took advantage of it. I trained real hard. We trained for six months, and we filmed for two months. But let me let me go back to the, because there's got to be people all across America thinking, gee, I could have uh, played a, a fighter in a movie without a great deal of experience, but you brought more to it than that. You did a fine acting job, but how do you get the job? How did you go up and, and introduce yourself, or did uh, Stallone know about you? Or uh, no, they saw did me you on audition? This, well, first, I first met Sylvester Stallone in 1978, when he came into the dressing room, Leon Spinks, how they lost to Ali. Then, but they saw me on this uh, contest, games people play, America's Toughest Bouncer mm-hmm. Contest. I mm-hmm. had just won it the second time, and I was standing there being interviewed, and the casting director at the time was turning the channel, and she just stopped, she said, hey, this guy's different, and he can talk. Yeah. So they called me up, and I, I boxed Sylvester Stallone two rounds in October 80. He called me back for a screen test, and we did the screen test. He'll tell you that I was the only one of over 1,200 Guys auditioned for the part. I was the only one who auditioned about ten page script without looking at it. Mm-hmm. You know, and he said that impressed him. Yeah. Among other things that I did. Yeah. Well, you, very impressive. Uh, very impressive person. What are we going to do here? We're going to we're going to pause. Uh, we'll come back. You, you can stick around for a few more minutes, can't you, sir? Sure, as long as you pay me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what we can come up with. Uh, we have time for just a couple of quick questions. I know. You mentioned that you're making your living as a bodyguard now, and uh, but if somebody came up with another movie part, you'd certainly take that, wouldn't you? Well, yeah, it's got to be the right parts. You know, been too many. Uh, I don't get involved in no black exploitation movies, no dope dealing movies, no pimp roles, things like that. And I tell them if they want me in other movies, give me the type of roles that you give Charleston Heston. Give me a, <laughs> a, a Moses part in the Red Sea and the Ten Commandments. Give uh-huh. me a Ben Hur, because uh-huh. I am talented enough to play them type of roles. So I just won't get involved with just no trashy stuff. Have you have you been offered some pretty good things, or are you looking at things? Well, like? I'm taking my time. I uh, want to have control of my destiny. They bring me a lot of things, but I'm not really, you uh-huh. know, 
Do you have an agent, a manager, and so forth now? Uh, believe it or not, really, I don't, because a long time ago they told me, say, Mr. T, you ain't hot enough. We don't only take stars, so I tell them I'm too hot for them now. Uh -huh. you know? <laughs> uh, and you have a book that you've written? Right, well, it's, uh, I'm playing with publishers now because, again, a long time ago they said, we don't want to hear no book about you. Now everybody <laughs> come, oh, you still got that book? We want it now. Uh -huh. The book is called uh, Mr. T, The Bodyguard. Now, go in detail in explaining why that I am the best bodyguard there is and in explaining why I'm the best is because that uh, I consider myself a kamikaze pilot when it comes to bodyguarding. They were dedicated to their country. I'm dedicated to my client. If there's a gun in the room, I will take the bullet. If there's a knife, I will take stab. I will be stabbed. So I don't fear death. That's the reason why I'm the best. Mm. And in my book, I go into detail and explain all that. And also, I explain that everybody needs a bodyguard, whether you can afford one or not. Because all the time a crime is committed, it has nothing to do with money. There might be people that just don't like you for whatever reason. A lot of people out there don't like me. I deal with that. Mm -hmm. you know. Now, do you, would, do you need a bodyguard, do you think? Uh, God protects me. Uh -huh. That's yeah. why I don't fear nothing or worry or hate or whatever, yeah. you know. Uh, it's a fascinating way to make a living, and I hope you get a, a, another really good part that you're interested in doing. And thank you for being here, and I'm sorry about the mix-up last week. We're okay now, aren't we? No, that's okay, because, you know, you said we're going to pay me for it, so it's all right. Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. T, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, thank you very much, sir. Nice meeting you.